Welcome to this lecture where we will take a closer look at queuing delay and the buffer bloat phenomenon. My name is Anna Brunström, professor in computer science at Karlstad University. So we have seen in earlier lectures that there are many different sources of delay over an internet connection. And buffer bloat is a very important source of delay because it can be very large in magnitude. And this means that it may have a large impact on application performance. So let us start with an overview of what buffer bloat is. So buffer bloat occurs as a result of excessively large and frequently full buffers in the network. So first we have to understand that the buffers in themselves are not a problem. Buffers are actually essential for the proper functioning of a packet switched network. So you need buffers in order to absorb short traffic, traffic bursts, for instance, when you have multiple flows that compete for an outgoing resource. So the problem occurs because the buffers have now today many times become very large. And this is an effect of the focus on throughput that has been common within the network community. And if you get overly large and unmanaged buffers, then this can cause problems. And this in combination with the senders on the internet that actually tried to fill buffers may create large delays and it may create standing queues at the bottlenecks in the network. And we will look at more detail into this in the lecture. So the second point to point out in this overview is that the buffer bloat appears at the path bottleneck. And this means that the bottleneck and where buffer bloat occurs can change over time. And this is a problem in the sense that it makes it difficult to identify buffer bloat and see the problem. Because you may have a lot of large buffers lurking around in your network and they are not visible until the bottleneck ends up there and you have senders that actually also fill the bottleneck. And this is why these buffers are sometimes occur referred to as dark buffers because they are not visible, they are dark and then all of a sudden they pop up and they cause delays and hamper application performance. So let us take a closer look at the cause for buffer bloat. So first we need to understand the relationship between throughput and delay as we send an increasing amount of packets into the network. So this is illustrated in the graph on this page. So on the x-axis you have the packets in flight and on the top graph you have the throughput and on the bottom graph you have the delay. So as we send an increasing amount of packets into the network at an increasing rate, the throughput will go up. And this will continue up to a certain point. Once you are fully utilizing the capacity, then you can no longer increase the throughput and the throughput remains constant. If we then look at what happens to the delay in the same situation, in the beginning, when you increase the rate of the packet sending into the network, nothing happens to the de delay. The delay is still small because there is no queuing yet in the network. Once you reach the point where your sending rate meets the capacity of the network, then we will start to accumulate a delay. And if our buffers are large, this delay will just accumulate more and more as the sending rate increases and we get more and more packets in flight. So you can see that this can cause a problem if we have large buffers and we send quickly. So next, let us look at how we send into a network. And here we have to recall how the basic congestion control works within the TCP protocol, which is the most commonly used protocol on the internet for reliable communication. So how does TCP send data into the network? Well, as it does not know how much capacity is available, it has to try and sense this capacity. And it does that by starting in what is called the slow start phase. And here we exponentially increase our sending rate, probing for more capacity into the network. And you can see that if we have a lot of buffering 
we are just going to increase our capacity more and more until eventually we encounter packet loss. Once a packet loss occurs, and if we lose a lot of packets, as in this example, when we have a big overshoot in the beginning, we will reset our congestion window to 1, and we will again start in the slow start phase. But this time, we will exit slow start once we reach the so-called slow start threshold. And this slow start threshold is set based on the congestion window we had when we encountered the previous loss. Once we, we reach the slow start threshold, we will go into congestion avoidance. Here we are slowly increasing our rate, just with a single packet per round trip time. Still, if we do this over a long enough time, we will again encounter a packet loss. Now, if we can detect this without a timeout, we will go into we will reduce our congestion window and we will maintain in congestion avoidance. So the important point to note here is that TCP with its basic congestion control behavior will send data into the network at an increasing rate until loss is encountered. And this means that if we increase the size of our buffers to try and avoid loss or to try and uh, capture and allow a high sending rate, this does not interact well with TCP because TCP actually needs the loss feedback to detect that it's now sending at an appropriate rate. So let us look at another illustration of that and see what happens to the queue in the network. So again, we have a TCP connection starting up. And initially, we send a large burst of packets into the network. And these packets will reach the bottleneck. And at the bottleneck, the packets will be spaced out because they need to go through this thin uh, bottleneck. When the packets reach the receiver, we know that in TCP, the receiver will send an acknowledgement back to the sender. And these packets, these acknowledgements, will then travel back to the sender. And not until these acknowledgements reach the sender can the sender inject new packets into the network. So now let us see what happens in the second phase after the first burst have been sent into the network. Now the packets are going through the bottleneck at an even pace and we have acknowledgement going back from the receiver to the sender. The sender will now insert one new packet for each acknowledgement it receives. So we are now in what is called the ACK clocked phase, where we essentially insert the packets into the network at the same pace as they leave the network. But what we can now observe in this figure is at the front of the queue here, we have a lot of packets still queued up. And this is what we call a standing queue, because as we are now sending at the same rate as the packets are going through the bottleneck, this queue will not decrease. It will just be sitting here for no good and not helping us, because we want to use these queues to absorb short-term bursts in the sending rate, but that is not what is happening here. These packets are just sitting here and not doing us any good and they are creating delay for all the application data that goes through the path. And if we take a look at what the queue length looks like for the communication we just observed, we will see that once in the initial phase, when we are increasing the sending rate, the queue will rapidly grow once it has started to build. Then once the initial burst is over and we are not sending any data into the network for a period of time, this queue will decrease. Once the first acknowledgements are starting to reach the sender and we are sending data into the network at the even pace, this queue will just remain its size and just vary a little bit from the packets that go in and out. 
And this is then the standing queue that has now formed in the network, adding delay to the communication and bringing no benefit. Because it also takes up some of the queue space that we would like to use for uh, accepting and managing the short-term bursts. So we have now seen how buffer bloat occurs and how it interacts with the TCP congestion control. So why has buffer bloat received so much attention in recent years? There are a few uh, reasons for this. So first, as I already mentioned, the buffers in the network has grown over time due to this high focus on high throughput and on optimizing utilization. And in the past, when memory was expensive and we had very limited buffering, increasing the buffer sizes was a good thing for performance. But as memory has gotten cheap, we have now and over time seen adding buffers as an easy fix to improve throughput and network utilization. This has created the problem where we now many times have oversized buffers that do not help us either for latency and also not for throughput as TCP will fill the buffers and actually need the loss signal to moderate its sending rate. And TCP has also gotten better at filling the buffers. So in the past, we've had some implementation problems that have limited the sending rate. We had, for instance, a bug in the Windows XP software that was used in many Windows machines uh, some years ago, uh, where the receiving window was limited. And this meant that uh, the sender could not increase its sending rate beyond a certain rate. The congestion controls has also become more efficient over the years, so they are now better at fully utilizing what they perceive as the available capacity and bringing the connection into loss. At the same time, we had seen a growing coexistence of different types of services over the network, where we today often have interactive services like VoIP and video and gaming, while some other large file transfers may be happening at the same time. So maybe someone in the household is looking at the streaming service and someone else is trying to play a game at the same time. If these flows now share a bottleneck, the delay that the streaming service introduces will ruin the performance for the gaming service. So it's also an effect that we now much more, uh, we notice it much more on our applications when we have this mix in the traffic. So let us look at some measurements illustrating this interaction between different types of flows and what does that, what that can do to application performance. So what we see in this graph is the latency experienced over time for a set of measurement flows running uh, both ICMP ping and UDP ping. And the black line here is the average of these uh, flows measuring the latency in the network. And when the measurements start, these low, inter low rate interactive flows is the only flows in the network. When we get into five seconds, we start up a number of TCP connections in both the downlink and uplink direction. And you can see as TCP is starting to fill up the buffers, our UDP and ping flow is experiencing an increasing latency. And in this particular example, when the buffers are full in the network, the delay is now up to around 800 milliseconds. And this delay is constantly experienced by the interactive flows until the TCP connection completes and the delay again drops down, down to a very small level. And of course, you can imagine what happens to, for instance, a uh, voice over IP flow running on this connection when the big uh, data transfer start. You will not have a very good performance with 800 milliseconds of latency. Basically, you will not be able to communicate with each other. So to summarize, we have seen in this lecture that buffer bloat can add significant delay into the network. And it appears due to the combination of having large network buffers and having senders that try to fill these buffers. And as TCP congestion control works in the way it does, it will try to fill the buffers that are available.
And this is particularly problematic when we have interactive services and large file transfers coexisting. And in the following lectures, we will see, at some, see some examples for how we can try and mitigate this problem.